everyone, and welcome to Canon Creative Studios, virtually here at Sundance Film Festival. My name is Jay Holden. I'm a contributing editor to American Cinematographer Magazine, and today I have the pleasure of talking to Mr. Daryl Wine. Hi, Daryl. Thank you for coming, and thank you for being here with us. It's just us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, right. I look forward to, to chatting about movies and cameras and whatever else you want to talk about. Tell me tell everybody what how it ends is about how it ends is a story of a woman played by zoe lister jones who also happens to be my co-director and wife in real life uh, who is going on a journey on the last day on earth through the streets of los angeles to make it to her last party before the world ends and she runs into an eclectic cast of characters along the way no, this was a production that you guys did during the height of quarantine or just during the pandemic? We made it during the height of the pandemic. Yes, in the middle of it. And uh, yeah, we made it under our, uh, our own production company, Mr. Lister Films, and just, yeah, went out and made it happen. <laughs> that's amazing because that's what every filmmaker wanted to do. We're all struggling and we're all sick at home and we're dying. And you guys actually went out and made something, which is pretty extraordinary. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, I mean, when, when the pandemic started, you know, we were super bummed and feeling all the feels that everyone I think was going through, you know, searching for toilet paper, you know, <laughs> wondering if we were going to have enough canned food for the next week. And, you know, as the months wore on and we were sequestered for so long, we had so much time on our hands to, you know, sit around and yes, be depressed and, and watch a, sh a lot of Netflix and, and, and other movies on Criterion and wherever else we could find stuff. Um, and, uh, and then at a certain point, we just, you know, Zoe and I started talking about what we were going through and you know, that was the other funny thing about quarantine is you have so much time to look at yourself and, and, you know, reflect on uh, your life and, you know, what it all means. And uh, that was kind of how this idea was born. We were doing a lot of inner child work on ourselves and in therapy, trying to investigate, you know, kind of our past wounds as people and trying to figure out, you know, what did little Daryl and little Zoe really crave when they were kids that, you know, they're not getting now, which I think is beneficial work for anybody to do, but it's really hard and difficult to go back into, you know, what those struggles were um, that you might not have even known were there until you really start to unpack it and journal about it and, and kind of, you know, go through it. Uh, in a deep way. And there's a lot of, I think everybody carries a lot of um, inner pain that uh, might not be as, you know, readily accessible in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so with quarantine, <laughs> you really get to sink into it and really sit in all of, all of uh, those, those emotions. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we thought it would be really fun to channel what we were feeling into a kind of a reverent uh, metaphysical narrative of sorts where Zoe gets to go on this kind of ride. And um, we were trying to think of ways to be resourceful and economical. And we've made a few films that uh, we uh, made, you know, on our own under Mr. Lister. Um, so our first film, Breaking Upwards, which got 10 years ago now, um, we made in a similar fashion of just kind of going out there with friends and doing it on our own with a really small crew. I remember we shot Breaking Upwards in the HVX 200 with <laughs> P2, P2 cards, if you remember those. And uh, oh man, that was such a funny process back then. Um, and, you know, flash forward to now, and we did a kind of similar thing. It was almost like a documentary film crew. Uh, I, I needed it to feel really light and, and nimble um, so that we could be spontaneous and versatile with what we were trying to capture. 
and these moments with all these friends of ours um, who were going through similar, you know, experiences with quarantine and feeling scared and not sure about shooting something. And, but we had all kind of reached this point where we wanted to get out of the house and, and try and do something still in a safe manner. You know, we adhered to uh, all of the PPE and health, um, you know, city and state requirements and the white paper that, that Hollywood put out. And uh, we, you know, we met these actors wherever they were at and allowed them to kind of infuse what they were going through into the story um, in a way as well. So it was this really kind of organic, um, fun process. Was a lot of it scripted or was it improvised? We scripted a lot of it. Um, there were many, many scenes that were written, Zoe and Kaylee's scenes, uh, the two leads, all of those were scripted. And, you know, see our you know, scene with like Helen Hunt is scripted and, and a number of others. But we, we also allowed for um, a lot of room for the actors to be able to improvise. And we had this kind of structured outline that had the story beats in it for each of the scenes that were, weren't written. And so we had conversations with the actors and told them kind of what we wanted to accomplish. Here's kind of, you know, the vibe. And then we would shape it with them on the day, but allow them to kind of be able to come up with stuff um, in tandem with what we were bringing to them. When we're talking about your, your friends and, and these actors, you, you have an extraordinary cast that's from Bradley Whitford. And, you know, of course, Zoe uh, being the lead, but you can Bradley Whitford and, and Nick Kroll and Olivia Wilde and Helen Hunt and uh, yeah. Polly Shore. <laughs> yeah. It, it's pretty amazing. And, and I, I imagine that everybody was um, really excited to actually work to do something, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. So excited. I, people were desperate to just see each other you know so like yeah. suddenly to just like be not only seeing each other in real life but to get to actually like make something creative and you know we're all artists so that's the best feeling in the world and so it, was, it felt very surreal like we were kind of on cloud nine doing it um and I feel like that energy is kind of infused into the story and the making of the film like it, it just has this very special intimate quality that I feel like I always am striving for, but sometimes can get really hard when you have a big set and a lot of people around and, and, get, and you know, you're so worried about so many different things, but this was very small. And, and so we were really able to let the performances and kind of what Zoe and I directorially were trying to do flourish. You and Zoe co-directed, co-wrote and co-produced this. Yes. And then I shot it and, uh, co-edited it with an editor that we had worked with on a previous film that we made called Band-Aid. Had you two ever worked together like that before? Obviously you had directed Zoe before, but have you ever co-directed and co-produced a production of it? We have produced all of our films um, for the most part, uh, but this is the first time that we co-directed and it was born out of a very authentic, natural you know, process, obviously, as we talked about before, which was really our personal experience kind of going through, you know, our own spiritual kind of journeys and practices with where we were at this past year and channeling that into kind of this fun, light, heartfelt, um, zany comedy of sorts. Um, and yeah, it was great to get to work with Zoe in this way. Cause usually in the past I had been directing her as an actor we were producing and, you know, in a lot of cases co-writing, but it was fun to be able to just both talk to the actors, both be like, all right, what if we did this? What if we did that? Or else we've been together um, for 15, 16 years as a couple. So we know how to work together as a team and communicate. Um, and we kind of know, you know, what we like. Um, so it, it create you know, it makes for the collaborative creative process that much more fluid. You originally meet on Breaking Upwards. <laughs> we both went to NYU Tisch School of the Arts and we met just after that. Uh, and I had gone and made a short film and a documentary and Zoe was really focused more on acting. 
Uh, we were like two years into our relationship when we made Breaking Upwards. And then that kind of cemented our collaboration. And we've, you know, made some stuff separately. Zoe made the craft um, for Sony and Blumhouse this past year. And um, before that, I had made this film called White Rabbit, which was at Sundance uh, two years ago. And uh, so we, yeah, we, we kind of come together uh, when when we want to, and then also kind of uh, flex our own personal creative muscles in other places as well. It's important to get that distance a little bit sometimes. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a lot. We we've we've definitely um, you know experienced the hardships of twenty four seven working together, and and also the you know the highs. Um, you know, it, it, it's been a learning process for better, you know, for over a decade. And it's, it's, it's interesting to be working with someone so intimately and know them so well. And, you know, you, you both get so passionate, it's like family, you know, you're sometimes you, you don't always communicate um, in a way that's, that's calm and loving, but we've gotten to a place where we're really gentle and you know, try and be really thoughtful with how we express what we both need and what we want, whether it's in our relationship or, or on set creatively. You, as you had mentioned earlier, you were also the cinematographer on this. Uh, is that a new role for you or is that something you've done before? I, so I shot How It Ends with, uh, with my buddy Tyler Buse, who I uh, also shot White Rabbit with um, before this, and uh, and I had I had DP'd another feature film called Blueprint uh, before that, which um, was my first film as a DP. So this was this was my third film as a DP, and I don't even really think of myself that much at, of a DP. It's more, you know, in, in all three of these circumstances, in some ways, like out of necessity. And also, I don't know, it was like really wanting to just feel like I was looking through the camera and getting even closer to the story than I had in the past. And trying to also hearken back to my youth when I would just pick up a little mini DV or high eight camera and just go shoot with my buddies. And the fun that I had in doing that, I've, I think always, always looking to try and recapture what that experience was like when I was in high school. And, and this is no exception. I, I love just going out with one other cinematographer, one sound person. We had a virtual UPM uh, production assistant that helped us. And we just basically did everything ourselves. I was pulling focus for my camera. He was pulling focus for his, you know, moving around, setting up our own lights. It, it was just the best. There is a, a certain intimacy and purity to directing through the camera um, that you don't really see too often in the Hollywood system, but there's a connection that happens. So there was always a connection that happens with the actors and the operator. So being the operator and the director, I think, has a, a certain immediacy to, to be yeah. close to the actors like that. There's a purity to that. Yeah, I, I think I always looked up to like Steven Soderbergh and some of these guys that, you know, would just sit behind the camera and really knew what they were doing. And I, I felt in some ways inadequate as a director at, earlier in my career where I didn't always know what is that lens or you know, what is, well, what is that light you're setting up? I, I just wanted to know more and, and, you know, be even uh, more knowledgeable about the craft. And I thought that that would maybe lend itself to a more authentic telling of, of the stories that I've been trying to make. And um, yeah, I think, I think this one, you know, I hope hopefully shines for, for that reason. Um, it was fun to be able to. And my last film I shot, um, very verite, all handheld. And, and that was very challenging to, to be directing and focusing and choosing your camera in a kind of artful way. Uh, but this, I, I opted for a more stoic 
composed look. Uh, so you get these beautiful shots of empty streets of LA and, and the actors um, kind of get to walk into them. And, and so I was a little bit more disciplined in choosing my frame this time around. What did you shoot this on? We shot it on the Canon uh, um, C 300 Mark II or Mark yeah, III uh, with the uh, with the Canon L series lenses. I mean, very you know documentary mm -hmm. kind of setup. Like I was saying before, I I wanted to just be super light on our feet and feel almost like a documentary crew um, in that it, 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 we could just pick up and move and um, still have it feel cinematic. So, you know, I was often shooting with Tyler, you know, at, uh, I would say like, I don't know, well, we, we would mostly be shooting somewhere between like two and, and, and 4.5. Um, terms of focal length so you know it, it had a nice depth of field um and um and then the zoom you know uh lens was kind of my primary lens as opposed to going primed you know we we, sh we were playing mostly with the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200 and uh you know that was great because we could you know quickly get different camera angles as, and not have to go through the process of changing out primes, which I didn't have an assistant camera operator um, to help. So it was easier to just do it that way. And, um, and yeah, find, find the, the look kind of in, in a kind of fly by your seat kind of sense. Well, especially those two lenses, you cover a great range with those yeah. two. So you, you got a lot of flexibility. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, they're really nice easy to use lenses again. Again, I feel like I'm a baby cinematographer. I, I really feel like I don't know that much um, compared to obvious, you know, real cinematographers out there. Um, but I, I kind of know I'm, I'm getting a better sense film after film of where I like to place the camera. And, you know, I can't wait to shoot with like, uh, you know, real cinema lenses um, as a cinematographer. Um, which I have in the past, like we shot our second film, Lola Versus, on 35, and that was really beautiful to to shoot with um, film lenses. And and uh, and and we shot um, film that I that I helped produce, which Zoe directed, Band Aid. Um, we shot on the Alexa with with beautiful anamorphic lenses. Um, but you know, these Canon lenses for this uh, were really great and easy to focus with, and um, yeah, I think have a have a really nice look to them. Why the choice of the C three hundred? It was mostly just uh, I liked, you know, how light it was, and um, I, you know, I was I was looking at the the FS seven, um, and there was just something about the Canon that felt a little smoother to me. Uh, I liked the color profile, and it was very intuitive to use. I remember I came into Canon Burbank and uh, just did like a quick little tutorial of the camera with this uh, guy, Charles there. Um, and, uh, and he just showed me like within 30 minutes how to use the whole camera. And I was like, oh man, this feels really easy to figure out on my own. And, and uh, yeah, and it really was. Yeah, like you said, it, it's very intuitive. Yeah, and we, you know, we we shot 4K raw, and uh, and then you know made proxies for editing purposes in Adobe Premiere, and then you know onlined back to uh, 4K. Yeah. How long did it take to shoot this? We didn't have a really traditional schedule because we shot this during pandemic, and it, you know. A really weird time. Uh, we shot it over the course of about three weeks, and not every day, um, but some somewhere in that we managed to cobble together a feature. <laughs> yeah. Well, fantastic! Congrats on that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and you cut this. I edited it with Libby Kunin, who edited Band-Aid and is a very talented editor. And uh, we had a great assistant editor, Alyssa Carroll, uh, who works with Libby sometimes and worked with her on the craft. And, uh, and then I had an additional editor named Ella Hadamian, who helped me as well um, with syncing and assembling um, certain scenes. And yeah, it was a it was a very organic process. We passed things back and forth, and then I kind of took on the second half of the editing um, work uh, as we kind of got further down the line, and, and we're working to finish the film and and get it to to its final place. And is that is that a normal process for you to to be that intimately involved in the editing, or is that a new thing? I, um, sorry, my dog's barking. Uh, it's all right, make her cameo appearance. <laughs> yeah, there she is. <laughs> Hi there, little <laughs> one. Um, I have been very intimately involved in editing uh, most of my films. I edited Breaking Upwards. I was in the editing room every day for Lola Versus. I edited Blueprint. Uh, I was in the room a lot for Consumed and, um, and White Rabbit, I co-edited with uh, another group of editors. And yeah, this, so I, I, I it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's very laborious and tedious, but you know, in some ways you get such a good knowledge of the performances and, and you really, you know, it's an, ex it's just more of an extension of your initial vision to be able to really edit the patterns and the rhythms that you saw in your head when you were, when you were conceiving of it and writing and directing. So that I think works in many ways to your benefit, but, 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 but it's also really nice to have another editor weigh in and come up with something that you might not have instinctually done. And that was where I really relied Zoe and I both on Libby um, being able to do a lot of that that work, um, and she's so great with comedy, so it helps to to be able to bounce ideas off of another editor. Yeah, for sure. But there's a uh, going back to the word I used earlier, kind of a purity to to being the writer, director, cinematographer, editor. You you are the auteur, really, right? Yep. I don't know if yeah. you subscribe to that particular theory. If you want to call me an auteur, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. You are co-auteurs with Zoe. Yes. Exactly. Is that, is that possible? Can you... Sure. Why not? Right. We're coining that term right now, co-auteurs. Yes, we're co-auteurs. I love it. Totally. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was really fun to make it with, with Zoe and and yeah. Uh, I hope people are going to be excited by it. Yeah, absolutely. This is so, somewhat of an existential examination of what all of us were feeling and still are feeling in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, you said that the, the idea of the inner child metaphysical um, being uh, came out of personal therapy that you and Zoe were doing? Yes, exactly. It was just, yeah, a lot of, um, as I was saying before, trying to look at what were some of our blocks as people and fears. And again, we were feeling pretty depressed about the world and the state of the union at the time that this was being conceived. And so the idea of the younger self, which we were working on in our real lives, was kind of the, the fun device that we had come up with to be able to explore a lot of those feelings in the film. And, you know, Zoe being able to kind of talk through her state of mind uh, with her younger self uh, was a fun way to, to, you know, be able to have, you know, 
dialogue in the film. <laughs> so she's not just by herself. Um, so from a practical sense, um, but I think it's something that's really universal and relatable to a lot of people. You know, we all have these voices inside of our head and, you know, you're thinking, should I do this? Your ego is telling you one thing and your heart is telling you another thing. And we're all trying to make sense of it. And so this, you know, metaphysical journey was kind of a uh, representation of that very mindset. And how did you go about casting? Zoe's younger self. Well, Zoe had worked with Kaylee Spaney on the craft. So they had formed an amazing friendship and she was also, you know, bored and, and depressed with the state of the world. And, you know, we, we were such, um, become such good friends with Kaylee that we uh, just asked her if, if she was interested in, in, you know, stepping outside <laughs> and, uh, and playing with us um, in a safe way. Um, and she was so excited to, to do it. And then the other actors were all just friends of ours, just people that Zoe had worked with or I had worked with. And we asked if they wanted to, come along on this journey with us. And, and um, fortunately, so many of them had nothing to do. <laughs> uh, but I think they also were excited by the story we wanted to tell. And, you know, it's different than, than a lot of the apocalyptic end of world movies that you tend to see where things are blowing up. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the anti-Michael Bay pandemic <laughs> experience. <laughs> Uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, I think that was refreshing um, to a lot of the cast. You also organically made it uh, work so that everything was exterior, right? Which I imagine was done primarily for safety and, and for COVID concerns. But uh, yeah. the fact that uh, Zoe gets her car stolen at the beginning of the film and has to walk through Los Angeles uh, desolate streets of Los Angeles, which are eerie to see. Uh, yeah. And then every encounter is basically outdoors. Yes, we, you know, we had to get creative with the storytelling and, you know, where we could be and where we could shoot. And so in some ways we wanted that to be the, the, the story, you know, this kind of fun walkabout and that kind of before sunrise vein. But you know, we also were limited by what we could do. So we kind of had to take our creative instincts and pair them with, you know, the health guidelines and see what that happy medium looked like. And I assume that was a decision when you were writing the script, like what are our parameters? What are our restrictions? And how do we make exactly. this organically work? Yeah, so it was kind of like a fun challenge creatively and, and almost like an assignment <laughs> to try and figure out like a science experiment, how can we pull this off uh, and do it in a way that feels, you know, simple enough, but, you know, not too crazy difficult. I mean, obviously it was, it's making any movie is hard um, with the schedules and logistics and costumes and hair and makeup and scenes and actors and, cameras and technical I mean there's so many things you know I didn't have a DIT to help with transferring footage and I, I you know I was wearing so many hats and so was Zoe and so were my other um, creative partners so it was it was a lot to take on um, and you know we were also feeling so emotional about the world and like ourselves and so it was also just a little weird in that sense, but at the same time, incredibly cathartic. Yeah. It's also almost um, a film school in and of itself is, first of all, the inspiration of don't allow these outside forces to stop you from being creative, which is a wonderful, you know, inspirational sort of message to get out there to the filmmakers, but also working within the restrictions that you have. Yeah, making that work narratively. I think that there's a wonderful lesson to be learned. From. Totally. I, thank you. I really appreciate you um, saying that. 
Totally. I think, I think that, you know, a lot of filmmakers, um, you know, think that you have to have so many things to, to make your movie. And, um, I'm constantly reminded of less is more and the simplicity of making something and how it can still be successful, you know, and at the end of the day, it's just about the story, you know, the the script and the performances and you don't necessarily need a hundred people. I mean, of course, if you're making, you know, contagion, (laughs) you know, you're going to need, you're going to need all that help, but not every story needs that. And, um, um, I think a lot of first time filmmakers, if I were, if I were to speak to them, you know, I would encourage them to just get out and try and make stuff and use what you have. And, And whether that's, you know, your own house or your friend's place, or, you know, you have a couple of buddies from film school or, people that you, you just, you know, can meet through social media who are interested in the craft. You know, there's so many ways to make stuff now affordably and all the equipment is at your fingertips. So all that's standing in anybody's way really is fear. And the, um, you know, mental traps that we fall into where you start comparing yourself to you're everyone around you and everything else that's out there. And so you spend so much time obsessing over the thing, the, the writing of your, your project, uh, is it going to be good enough? And I think that is detrimental to the creative, you know, um, spirit. It's, it's really hard to, I know, you know, it's hard to not be a perfectionist and I am that way too. And it's a battle that I face all the time. I'm always trying to challenge myself to let go, just stop worrying so much about it. Just, just go make it. And, you know, a lot of, I, 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 on the one hand, I envy the filmmakers that have made like film after film, like to perfection, you know, you look at like Paul Thomas Anderson or Spike Jones, like each one, like, these just like masterworks. Um, and I'm a little bit on a different journey. I'm like, each one is a different practice um, piece for me um, and a different moment in time in my life where I'm capturing what I'm going through and, and what I'm interested in at that moment. And I know there's things that can probably be stronger, um, but I'm doing the best that I can. And so I'm just trying to remind myself that's, that's, that's all I can do, you know? And, and that to me feels better than, you know, waiting 10 years for someone to say yes to, to green lighting a film. Absolutely. You're, you're proving that there's, uh, there's truth to just get out there and do it. Right. Exactly. Um, and you, you can do, do it. <laughs> Get out there and do it. Grab a cannon, go out and shoot. Exactly. Uh, and, and you guys did this so quickly. Uh, you did shooting you know, during 2020, during the, the pandemic, uh, and posting and, and getting it out. And, and now it's going to premiere at Sundance, uh, the very beginning of 2021. So that in, in itself is another shoot. Yes, it's a very truncated process and very exciting. Uh, again, we had so much time on our hands. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, when you don't have all the distractions of daily life and and things to do and people to see, you know, I just sat inside and worked on this film with Zoe and and went out and made it. And so it was it was nice to be able to to just yeah work on this project. Uh, <laughs> it was a very interesting, unique year. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> that is absolutely for sure. Thank yeah. you. There, I appreciate the time. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all of you for joining us at Canon Creative Studios virtually here at Sundance Film Festival. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. Yep. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. And yeah, follow along uh, on social media and you can check out our films at mrlisterfilms.com. <laughs>